Okay, hello and welcome back everybody. I hope you've all had a lovely summer and if you're just trying to get back into the rhythm of things, try and understand the books that you're reading for A-Level again, um, I would highly recommend doing that, just personally. Um, if you're a bit lazy and you'd rather not read them again, I'm not going to criticise you. Uh, all I'm going to say is just watch these videos that I'm going to be putting out and hopefully I'll be able to just help you there. So I'm just going to be going through the first three chapters and some basic context for Wuthering Heights, um, which I do on the Edexcel exam board, and that's why there are going to be some things about A Thousand Splendid Suns as well, because that's the novel that I am comparing it to. A Thousand Splendid Suns on its own is a fabulous novel if you haven't read it and it's well worth reading, maybe for your own coursework if you are looking at books to do for coursework as well. This is for the theme, Women and Society, I think it is. So if you're doing that theme, this might be helpful for you as well. Who knows, right? So I'm going to have to concentrate a little bit as well on the role of women, but everything is beneficial. So context, the Gothic. So the Gothic is generally seen as an offshoot of the Romantic period. It has a lot of the similar sort of, I'd say, hallmarks. It has the... Um, very emphatic focus on the human, the personal, and the emotional, as opposed to the cold rationalism of the Enlightenment, and the focus on logic that was seen through a lot of the science and philosophy that was coming through at the time. The Romantics and the Gothics wanted to kind of reject this, and they wanted to turn it on its head and embrace what you could call the human spirit and individualism. Gothic fiction really does narrow in on terror. It's, it's, uh, that's kind of what separates it from romantic fiction. It does focus on terror and it tries to excite the reader and make them, um, and make them more emotionally aware and it also uses the supernatural. So if you've read Frankenstein then that's a gothic novel. If you have read um, if you have read, uh, I, don't know, I shouldn't be struggling here, Dracula, then that's also a gothic novel. There are, uh, there are modern gothic novels as well, like The Secret History by Donna Tartt, and that fits into the gothic genre um, for the reason that it's it contains a lot of gothic elements of horror, a lot of gothic elements of what's called the sublime, so um, a state beyond ordinary experience, emotionally. And also in um, a secret, The Secret History, there is this use of dreaming and this use of um, out-of-consciousness experiences, such as in the last few chapters of the book. It's a very good book. I'd recommend you read it. Um, Alan Murs, who is a literary critic, um, there are very few times I will bring up literary critics uh, but this is one of those cases. She considers Wuthering Heights to be female gothic because it focuses on how women are trapped, subjugated, and, in it, and attempt to escape such restriction. Now, part of this is because it is written by a woman. I'd argue there is a certain quality of that because it's written by a woman. Um, there are, if if we go by this definition, then there are some other books that would go by this definition, and I'd encourage you to think about those. I'd say that the secret history might might think about it, might think about these sort of female gothic ideas because of how uh, Camilla is sort of traded around <laughs> by the men, to put it really bluntly. So now going on to the Brontes and their childhood. So. Um, it was Emily Bronte who wrote Wuthering Heights, so that's who we're concentrating on. So the Brontes all grew up in Haworth. Yes, it's pronounced Haworth, not Hayworth or any other. It's Haworth on the edge of the Yorkshire Moors. And they were raised with a curate who apparently viewed parenting and Christianity with a lot of leniency. This will come in into the way that I, when I discuss how Edgar Linton is presented, this will come in to how I discuss him. Um, because Edgar Linton was viewed as, at the time he was viewed as weak and not necessarily moral, 
but it's arguable that actually the Bronte ethos would have viewed him as moral nonetheless because of his take on loving parenting in the novel. Um, that also Christianity with leniency, um, the Bronte, uh, Emily Bronte, um, definitely also inherited that. She inherited this very sort of lenient view of Christianity that distanced itself from established religion. She was definitely religious, we know that about her, but she was also distant from established religion. So in their childhood, Emily and Anne, two of the Bronte sisters, uh, they wrote about a mythical island called Gondol and this uh, resulted in a flurry of um, stories and poetry and they were highly inspired to do this by the, uh, by romantic figures such as Byron, um, Shelley and Walter Scott. Um, so you can read their poetry as well and you might see bits where you go, ah, that's romanticism, that's interesting. Um, Emily has been described as a reclusive figure. Uh, she developed fairly few really resonantly strong relationships, um, but the closest relationships she had were within her family, which is why the biographical info that we do get nowadays comes from Anne, her sister. Uh, also, three of her older siblings died in childhood, so death was kind of all around her. So when we consider death in Wuthering Heights, we should really consider how she was influenced by death as well. So now on to the actual novel. So, this is just the plot. I'd recommend reading the book, but if you don't fancy it, I'm not going to judge you. I don't, I think it's a good idea, but I think the usual recommendation is that you should read the book four times for an A-level. Um, but if you don't want to read it during the summer holiday, I kind of get that actually, so don't worry about it. So chapter one, Lockwood pays a visit to his la landlord Heathcliff. Now, Lockwood is the um, is the perspective from which the novel is written. Uh, so he, uh, he is the narrator, he is our narrator, we are introduced to our narrator. Um, he's called Lockwood. He's in, he takes a visit to his landlord, Heathcliff, who seems to be dark-skinned, gypsy-like, as well as intensely misanthropic. This is something where Lockwood and Heathcliff will bond um, until Lockwood realises that Heathcliff is heavily more misanthropic than he is himself. Um, when Lockwood is left in the kitchen, uh, whilst um, Heathcliff, I believe, goes to get some wine, he attempts to pet the dogs who surround him and try and nip at him until a woman comes along and bashes some pans together and drives them off. Heathcliff returns and they have a good conversation and hot Lockwood, much to the dismay of Heathcliff, promises to return tomorrow. So, here is where we get the misanthropic versus not so misanthropic, but still certainly introverted sort of um, contrast. So, Lockwood seems to be a foil to Heathcliff in the earlier chapters. Um, this is mostly because they share similarities. They are delighted. Um, one of the first things that Lockwood says in the novel, if I can find it, it's about the Yorkshire Moors being a perfect misanthropist's heaven. So he's delighted to be in this sort of isolation. Um, yeah, misanthropist's heaven. Uh, towards the end of the chapter, he's remarked, he finds it remarkable that he's more sociable than Heathcliff. Heathcliff's personality is reflected in Wuthering Heights, as you, will, as you will see. There's a lot of this sort of symbolism for things in Wuthering Heights that you need to look out for. Uh, so the black eyes withdraw, just like the win windows of Wuthering Heights are deeply set. So the idea is that the windows could be comparable to the eyes of um, Heathcliff. Heathcliff may be dark-skinned as a visual to sem uh, symbol to evil. This is, <laughs> this is arguably a bit racist, to say the least. Um, there is commentary, which if you search it out, and I'd encourage you to, on how Heathcliff links to the Liverpool slave trade and how that link comes about. Um, anyway, Heathcliff may be dark-skinned and there's a lot of suggestions that he's of a different race and I definitely wouldn't rule it out. In fact, it's probably something you should mention. Um, if I can compare this a little bit just to um, Othello in Shakespeare. So Othello in Shakespeare 
dark-skinned character referred to as a moor. He's a moor living in Venice. Moor, whether that's an accurate term or not, is um, debatable. Um, but anyway, he's definitely black. He's definitely living in Venice. And he's viewed as less than because of his of his skin. Like, there's, um, there's, of course, that. But also there's the implication that because he's black, black is the opposite of white, and white is purity, and white is goodness, and white is the godly colour, and black is the opposite of that, black is satanic, um, and so forth. But we could apply this implication as well to Heathcliff, that he's dark-skinned, and this is viewed as the opposite of white, and so white is pure, so black is not <laughs> pure. It's there is definitely a racist element to this. I'm just going to say that and be honest. Um, at least I think there is. And But I wouldn't recommend saying that in your exam at all. Just say dark-skinned, opposite of white-skinned. There's an implication there, basically, is the way of putting it. Um, Lockwood's name uh, has the implication of cutting himself off and being misanthropic. Lockwood. He's... It's... It's more clear in chapter 3, because when you read chapter 3, he goes into a bed, a bed, yeah, basically, which he can lock, one of those massive wooden things that he can close the door on and lock. Now, that's why he's called Lockwood, basically, in theory, because he locks the wood to the door and he's um, isolated in that way in the bed. Um, but just viewing Lockwood as meaning just locking himself away from society in general is a is an interesting association to raise. I won't place too much emphasis on it because otherwise it'll be like a repeat of the whole Inspector Ghoul talk that your teachers probably had with you at GCSE if you did an Inspector Calls, where they were like, well, he might be a ghost because his name is Ghoul, but don't raise that too much. You know, it, it, it's a bit like that for Lockwood. So there's another thing we want to mention for chapter one, because chapter one is the setting of the scene. It's saying this is what Wuthering Heights is like. Um, and we've talked a little bit about that in saying that it's comparable to Heathcliff himself. Bronte loved the moors when she was a child and she uh, lived on it. But uh, Wuthering Heights does present them as inhospitable to outsiders, um, specifically at Heathcliff's re residence. So. Gaunt thorns all craving arms of the sun. So these thorns are, um, there's barely any sun, <laughs> um, presumably, uh, hence Wuthering Heights, it's, you know, it's windy, it's dark. Um, craving arms of the sun, they need charity, basically. They need charity, and who needs charity? Suffering people. Personification, right? It's unsustainable for natural life. We've also seen, if we go back, that... Lockwood is left alone in the kitchen and the dogs surround him and try and nip at him. That is also an attack. That's attacking him uh, and that suggests how inhospitable it is. So, this is where I compare it to A Thousand Splendid Sons. If you do A Thousand Splendid Sons, fab, that's great. Um, here's something that might help you. Just like Wuthering Heights being inhospitable and unfriendly to nature, the Colba, where Mariam in A Thousand Splendid Suns grows up, is inhospitable too. It is described as a rat hole, placed in direct contrast with the preceding descriptions of white trout-filled stream and speckles of bright and yellow flowers. So, this contrast between nature and the home is something which is very interesting in A Thousand Splendid Suns because it contrasts this beauty with the horror of where you live. So the beautiful outside, the horrible inside. This is interesting to look at in comparison to Wuthering Heights because in Wuthering Heights, the outside is reflective of the people inside, right? In A Thousand Splendid Suns, what's actually going on is that the outside, the natural world, is very much reflective of how Mariam wants to escape, or Mariam, there is a desire to escape, or should be a desire to escape from the Colba for Mariam, because it's nature out there, beautiful nature, and the Colba is a rat hole. For Heathcliff, however, if we wanted to make this comparison, there's just more stuff like him, just dying gaunt thorns and, you know, a massive ugly house, <laughs> just to be blunt. So, chapter two. 
So, Lockwood makes his way across the moor back to Wuthering Heights. He cannot get in, however, and must be let in by Hareton. Yeah, this is when he goes back to visit. Lockwood attempts to talk to a woman who is present, mistaking a pile of dead rabbits for kittens in the process. She refuses to make him tea until she is told to by Heathcliff. When they sit down to tea, Lockwood makes a number of mistakes about the family, Hareton, assuming that Hareton is Heathcliff's son and that the woman is Heathcliff, Heathcliff's wife. Interesting side note, if you wanted to go, go and have a look at this, um, the idea that Hareton is Heathcliff's son is actually an assumption um, made by another character in the book, uh, Catherine Linton, so Catherine's daughter. Um, so the woman is Cathy, so that's daughter Cathy. So that's the same Cathy who also at one point compared uh, or thought that Hareton was Heathcliff's son. Just interesting note. After tea, all, uh, all refuse to help Lockwood get back to Thrushcross Grange, so he attempts to run away with a lamp. He's knocked over by the dogs and end up, ends up being given lodgings for the night. Um, as well, Heathcliff and Hareton laugh at him as well. So, outside of the social order. So, of course, the Victorian period was very rigid in the social order, and there was very much this split between um, the... I don't know if you'd call them working classes at this time, you could call them working, although that has the implication of industrialization. Um, so I'd argue, just say lower classes might actually just be acceptable. Lower classes, middle class, uh, middle classes. There was very much this split there anyway. So, and also we're talking about women a lot, so we need to note what happens with women. So Wuthering Heights is a place where the social order is turned upside down. So Catherine can say, go, I'm looking at you to Joseph, and he leaves. So there's some power of women over men. Another thing, pardon me, um, in chapter one, uh, if I can find it, there is a moment where um, they, uh, where Lockwood discusses how he um, did not think he deserved his, um, yeah, did not think that he deserved a successful marriage. Um, While enjoying a month of fine weather at the seacoast, I was thrown into the company of a most fascinating creature, a real goddess in my eyes, as long as she took no notice of me. I never told my love vocally. Still, if looks have language, the merest idiot might have guessed I was over head and ears. She understood me at last and looked to return, the sweetest of all imagine, uh, imaginable looks. And what did I do? I confess it with shame, shrunk icily into myself like a snail. Um, at every glance, retired colder and farther. So, in that case, Lockwood as well is subject to this glance. He is subject to the female glance having power over him as a man, which is very interesting. Um... The contrast between Catherine, there is a contrast as well, um, between Catherine's appearance as well, and her attitude. Um, the most exquisite little face, delicate neck, and her attitude, so she turned upon me as a miser might turn if anyone attempted to assist him in counting his gold. So this reverses the expectations of society that a pretty woman will be an archetypal domestic goddess, basically. Um, and this is very interesting because in subverting the social order, Bronte is essentially... Um, marking out the diversity in womanhood, you could argue. And she is doing away with archetypes about women, okay? She is declaring women can be like this or this and women can have power. Very interesting for the time. Um, Lockwood and Joseph, when in dialogue, have a marked difference in speech. Lockwood does not fit in Yorkshire. If you've read the book, then you will look at some of Joseph's, Joseph's speech and think, what the hell is this? Sometimes, and I have parents from the Yorkshire area, so I should understand it, I just skip it, I just skip it, and it's just sort of a bit like, yeah. Um, because it's so difficult to understand. I know someone who, for their English language, um, whatever, whatever it is, coursework, I suppose you could call it, is actually researching how accurate Joseph's written speech is to how the Yorkshire dialect actually works. Sounds really interesting, actually. Um, and it, it, it just 
splits him off as well from not only the upper classes as well because he is a servant and even Nelly it splits him off from Nelly um, but it also splits him off from Lockwood. Catherine practices as well the black art something which makes her and Wuthering Heights appear more devilish so this is subversion of religion so this black art that she uses to shock um, Joseph when she says go I'm looking at you um, she uses the black art in that way and that really does subvert religion as well it's also a form of power for her as well so you could argue as in if you wanted to be interesting that because women can't find power or couldn't find power in the conservative religious norms of the time then Bronte gave power to a woman through the subversion of religion So chapter three is where the chapters get a bit more chunky. So here is your rundown of it. So Lockwood is given lodging in a room which Heathcliff does not usually allow anyone to sleep in. Zilla, who is the servant who takes him there, does not have an explanation for why. Um, except he, she says queer goings on that happen there. He reads over Catherine's three iterations of her name, um, Earnshaw, Heathcliff, Linton, as well as her diaries and notes in the margins of books. He also sees the title of a preacher named Jabes Brantham, which inspires his first uh, dream. So he sees a book by someone called Jabes Brantham. Um, and in this dream, he and Joseph go to Kimmerton Chapel, where Jabes Brantham is giving the sermon the book refers to. He goes through 490 sins, and when Lockwood complains, claims that he has committed the 491st. The church erupts in violence. He, uh, not Heathcliff, Linton, not Linton, damn it. Lockwood, thank you. Lockwood wakes as a brancher is tapping a window pane and goes back to sleep dreaming of Catherine Linton, who is coming home and wants to be let in. He stra scratches the ghost's arm on the window pane and shuts her out with a pile of books. Heathcliff appears in the room, woken by the noise, and tells Lockwood to wait, uh, wait downstairs. Lockwood hears him calling out for Catherine. Heathcliff then leads Lockwood home. So, what do the dreams mean? So the reading over of Catherine Earnshaw Heathcliff Linton describes the path of Catherine's romantic life. So uh, she first of all is born as Catherine Earnshaw, then she falls in love with Heathcliff, and then she goes uh, and marries Linton. Um, and when you read this back backwards, it goes through the journey of her daughter, uh, described in part two. It could be argued that this is actually why part one and part two are split up, because at part two that's when the Linton Heathcliff Earnshaw journey happens in part one it's the Earnshaw Heathcliff Linton journey um, so in part two Catherine's daughter is born as Catherine Linton she is forced to marry Linton Heathcliff by Heathcliff and then she when Linton Heathcliff dies she marries Hareton Earnshaw and she becomes Catherine Earnshaw again which brings the novel full circle the violence at Gimmerton Chapel reflects Bronte's own mildly suspicious views of organised religion. So, I might have understated the um, views of organised religion, but she did have quite suspicious views. Um, it's an appeal to the reader as well to just sort of not have that much trust in organised religion, and effectively to abandon what they think about religion. Because, of course, religious morality, Christian morality, was the thing in the Victorian era. And then... There's the and then in the in the third chapter there is this dream which depicts um, which depicts religious violence and readers should really cotton on and say religion doesn't equal morality look at the violence going on and they should be willing to set aside their religious morality for the rest of the novel. So dreams and ghosts are gothic staples in this novel as well, which shows us to a certain extent that it's gothic, and Bronte uses these to discuss morally challenging matters such as desire, religion, and love. So some of the most pertinent things come out in dreams. So um, when we get on to chapter, I believe it's chapter eight, maybe, either chapter eight or chapter nine, where, where Catherine uh, declares her love for Linton and then but she is challenged by Nelly, and then she comes out and says, actually, I had this dream about heaven and about hell and about where I was flung to when I, you know, didn't want to be in heaven. And she was flung in the middle of the moors. 
So this is a discussion of how she viewed religion, but it's also a discussion of how almost she viewed Linton and Heathcliff, because of course Linton, heaven, because he's pure, he's white, um, and he's blonde and rich and all of these virtues, supposed virtues, but she's flung onto the moors, which is where she was with Heathcliff, and also where Heath grows, Heathcliff. Haha, <laughs> interesting, right? Um, so you could, you know, it, it's uh, dreams in this way are a way of revealing ideas about what the characters want and what the characters feel and what Bronte thinks about certain social issues of the time. So that was a that was a brief overview of Wuthering Heights in the first three chapters with some context. I will try and get out some more stuff for chapters 4 to 6 and so forth until maybe we'll get to chapter 34. Depends how tired of this I get. Okay, I hope you all learned a lot from this and hopefully I will be able to discuss more with you next time. Okay, thank you very much and see you soon.